Hello, this is Brian Casey. I'm editor-in-chief of AmpMini.com, and we're here at the 2014 edition of the RSNA meeting in Chicago. We have with us right now Dr. Daniel Copans. He is with Harvard University and Massachusetts General Hospital. Thanks for being with us. It's nice to be with you, Brian. Now, we are going to be talking right now about the, uh, the, the controversy over breast screening. It's been going on for quite some time, and, and you've got some unique perspectives that you'd like to share with us. Well, you're absolutely right. It has been going on. It's been going on for too long. Um, I've been in uh, radiology or imaging for 40 years, and it's been going on for longer than I've been in the field. But I think it's very important that uh, women and their physicians understand that there is now a major effort to try and reduce access to breast cancer screening. Um, unfortunately, uh, this has involved the use of uh, data from trials that were uh, not particularly well done and the analysis uh, of those trials in a non-scientific fashion. Uh, my two major concerns are uh, recent uh, suggestions that there's massive overdiagnosis of breast cancer. That was in a New England Journal of Medicine. And overdiagnosis, again, can you, can you define that? Yeah, overdiagnosis are cancers that would never harm anyone and would disappear on their own. For example, a New England Journal of Medicine article uh, back a, f a year or so ago claimed that in 2008 alone there were 70,000 breast cancers that uh, never would have um, appeared had mammography screening not been undertaken. It turns out that the way that paper was done was faulty. It was based on estimates and extrapolations that were incorrect. Uh, no one has ever seen a breast cancer go away on its own, uh, and yet they were claiming 70,000 in one year alone. Uh, that made nas got national attention and uh, has really been uh, pushing the debate, the discussion, uh, now about massive overdiagnosis when in fact there's probably little or no overdiagnosis. Cancers, invasive cancers found by mammography are real cancers and if left alone will ultimately uh, kill someone. The other problem is there was a study that was done back in the 1980s uh, called the Canadian National Breast Screening Study. Uh, I actually was involved in reviewing their mammograms so I know a lot of the details of that study and unfortunately, the study was compromised from the beginning. Uh, first of all, it was a trial of mammography screening, and yet they used poor quality mammography. Even their own uh, physicist, Martin Yaffe from Toronto, has said that the quality of the mammography was very poor in the trial. You would think a trial of mammography screening would use very good mammography. Theirs was poor. But the major problem with that study was that when you do a randomized control trial, you need to divide a large group of women randomly into two groups so that both groups will ultimately be identical. The same number of women will develop breast cancer in group A as in group B, and the same number of women would die of breast cancer if you did nothing else. In that trial, they violated a major rule of randomized control trials by doing a clinical breast exam on everyone before they randomly divided them, so they knew who had breast lumps and who had large axillary lymph nodes. And then they assigned them on open lists. It wasn't a random allocation. And unfortunately, it compromised the whole trial. That trial should not be used in uh, evaluating the efficacy of mammography screening, yet I'm concerned that the rumor is that the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which is reviewing their mammography guidelines at this time, are going to place a lot of weight on the Canadian study. And if they do that, then they'll they'll greatly contract the number of women uh, being screened. They'll go to 50 and between 50 and 69 every two years, which will mean uh, that the major decline in deaths that we've been seeing, primarily due to screening, uh, will be compromised. Now, now you, you mentioned a major decline in deaths from screening, and it seems very obvious that the start of screening has, has led to a, a, a big decline in deaths from breast cancer, and yet screening opponents have an argument for that as well, don't they? Well, the screening opponents suggest that it's all due to therapy. Now, we all know that therapy has improved uh, significantly over the years. But if you talk to uh, medical oncologists, they will all tell you that they save lives with therapy when they treat breast cancer earlier. Uh, it's an interesting, uh, it's not proof, but if you look at uh, the death rate for men with breast cancer, uh, I think um, Murray Rebner was the first person to point this out to me, if you look at the death rate for men with breast cancer, we get breast cancer as well, and certainly not nearly as many as, as women. The death rate from breast cancer um, has gone, went up in 1990 for men, 
uh, and stayed high till about 2005, and then it came back down to 1990 levels. Whereas for women, mammography screening began in the mid-1980s in the United States, and soon after, in 1990, the death rate began to go down. And the death rate has continued to go down for women as more and more women are being screened. Yeah. So men have access to the same therapy, yeah. but it hasn't affected uh, our death rate. Yeah. Whereas for women, uh, the death rate has gone down in proportion to the number of women being screened. Now, in your daily practice, how much confusion are you seeing among women over what they should do with respect to, to screening? Because it seems like every other month or so, there's some new paper that's, that's casting uh, doubt on the, on the uh, effectiveness of screening. Well, uh, it, what we don't know is the women who aren't coming in. Uh, the women who come in will sometimes voice their concern, well, you know, I'm confused, I, why am I getting mammograms? No one in my family has breast cancer. And there are uh, smart physicians who are saying, well, no one in your family has breast cancer, you don't have to worry about it. What a lot of people don't realize is that the vast majority of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer each year are not at increased risk. Uh, about 10 percent of breast cancers diagnosed each year are among women who have a genetic abnormality and another 15 percent are in high-risk women, women with a family history or women who have had a biopsy proven uh, high-risk lesion. That counts for about 25 percent of all breast cancers. 75 percent are in women who aren't at increased risk. So the other attack on screening is by people who are saying, well, we need to tailor risk, tailor screening um, to the risk of the individual. Now, those of us in breast imaging say we should be increasing screening in high-risk women, so adding magnetic resonance imaging, for example, for a woman who has a genetic predisposition. But the other side is saying, no, let's reduce mammography screening in the average-risk women and only screen the high-risk women. Well, that way you'd miss most of the cancers. So there's a lot of misinformation that has been able to get out through the media, unfortunately. The media have not been very critical of, of uh, some of the uh, material that they're receiving through journals that have not been very critical. I mean, the New England Journal of Medicine, which is, I think, the Bible of journals, uh, has been really irresponsible in the breast cancer screening discussions. And, of course, if it's in the New England Journal of Medicine, then it's on the front page of the New York Times the next day. So what do you think radiology in general should do, and what can radiologists and breast imagers do in particular to try to counteract what's going on? Well, it's, it's a problem because uh, it's very hard to get, <coughs> excuse me, get anything in several of the medical journals. The New England Journal of Medicine won't publish any paper supportive of breast cancer screening. The Annals of Internal Medicine won't publish anything in support. Uh, my hope is, and what we're trying to do with, uh, through the American College of Radiology, is to get more radiologists to understand the data. One of the problems that I see, in, and it's probably true in all of healthcare, is that we're in a very complicated medical environment. The data are difficult sometimes to understand. And so there's only a handful of people who have the time or the interest to really delve into the numbers and understand what's going on. So it's like in the feudal days when uh, each army had a knight uh, who would joust, you know, to see who won the battle so that they didn't have everybody fighting. The support for screening has champions, and the opposition to screening has champions. And that's a real problem, because then you're relying on a handful of people on both sides. More people need to understand the issues uh, in detail so that uh, when a paper is published, for example, that is based on faulty analysis, People will, I mean, it frequently takes me days to unravel some of the papers mm -hmm. that are uh, published. And not many people have days to spend doing that. Uh, but we need more people to understand the data and not just say, well, I trust Copans or I trust on the other side Gilbert Welch or something like that. All right, good. All right, well, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Signing off for AntMini.com, my name is Brian Casey.